Good afternoon. I believe Mr. Shokin will first say a couple of words. First of all, Mr. President, thank you for finding the time in your busy schedule to meet the leaders of global companies. We have named our event here at the St. Petersburg Forum the Global CEO Summit. And this continues some sort of a tradition. Last year at the forum, we had the Business 20 Summit here, where we met the leaders of global business and Russian business and discussed recommendations and decided to take recommendations to you as the chair of the G20, of the president of G20. And we have informed the G20 leaders about our summit. And now we are continuing the tradition, and we have decided to continue discussion of the global economic agenda. The situation in global economy is still fragile, and many of the measures taken, including measures taken in St. Petersburg last year, are still being implemented and this implementation goes with difficulties. That is why the, uh, this discussion needs to be resumed and new recommendations should be made. The second direction that we discussed is business in Russia. First of all, these are systemic issues of improving the business climate and investment climate. And we understand that at our sessions and panels, we couldn't discuss all the matters. But as the St. Petersburg Forum gives us a lot of opportunities to discuss other matters, we will discuss them at other events today. We will discuss them tomorrow. And under the auspices of our summit, we have had a lot of bilateral business dialogues with our partners with bilateral business councils and associations of foreign business which work in Russia. We have not only discussed the problems, but we have tried to find some priorities. We had interactive votings on the key directions of business, and you see the results of this vote in front of you on the table. So we have singled out the most important issues that need to be solved in order to have influence on development of foreign Russian business and improve the economic situation. Well, there are traditional directions, that is investments and infrastructure. It is financial regulation, that is trade that is employment and social investments into the human capital, human resources, that is the openness of the government and struggle with corruption. So on this direction, I'd like my colleagues to inform you about the results of our discussions. But before they do so, I'd like to say that the main problem in investments and infrastructure was the public-private partnership. In energy security, we, by the way, have returned this topic into the agenda. And in 2008, in St. Petersburg, on the G8 summit, energy security was the topical issue. Then it left the agenda of the fora. Now we believe it must be returned. So energy industry should be regulated and driven by the real assessment of risks and economic effects of investments, not by the hypothetical suggestions of some sort. In financial regulation, like just like a year ago when we discussed this topic, the most important priority is not to let financial reforms have negative effect on long-term investments. We are not speaking about regulating more. We are speaking about more efficient regulation that would contribute to economic growth. In employment, of course, first place is taken by such a macroeconomic policy that stimulate uh, as job creation, efficient job creation. In trade, it's, of course, fighting with protectionism, 
during the last six years of the G20 existence, that topic took the first lines in the agenda. And the fact that it remains on the agenda shows that not everything has been done to solve this matter, even com as compared to our expectations. For example, the implementation of Bali agreement within the WTO. In the openness and struggle with corruption domain, that is the government procurement, which is the most important. This topic is really relevant for us and our partners. If we are speaking about the Russian priorities of creating favorable business climate in Russia, the priorities in the development of small and medium businesses are lifting the barriers for the activities of the new enterprises and simplifying the registration procedures and reg regulatory environment. Today we had the presentation of the rating of investment climate of different Russian regions, and we've discussed these topics. The second priority of getting better the investment climate in Russia is lowering the burden of re regulatory effect. So we must avoid duplication of inspections and oversight bodies, and we need to ensure the openness and transparency of the government oversight bodies. That's the gist of our activity here, and I will stop now. And I'd like my colleagues, as kind hosts, would like to give our foreign colleagues the floor. And the first, I'd like to give the floor to our Indian guest, Shumet Mazandar, the elected president of the Confederation of Indian Industry. Honorable President, sir, I'm going to talk about infrastructure, as he told you. The, amongst the G20 countries, the emerging markets are still struggling, and they haven't quite recovered. For the G20 countries as a group to uh, prosper, it's important that even the emerging countries prosper, so as a group we prosper. And it needs inclusive uh, prosperity. So I have uh, one suggestion, is that if some sort of a robust multilateral uh, investment framework can be built, and the governments extend special cooperation and a proper uh, mitigation process for losses be drawn up, then the, the required funding for these emerging markets would come, and it would really help the G20 countries to be prosperous in the long run. Uh, yes, he talked about the private and uh, public partnership. That is working quite well in India. But there are other issues that require uh, looking into. But this is one suggestion. The, the second point I'd like to make is by 2020, there will be more people retiring from, from the job market than entering the job market. Whereas India will have an excess of working age people. I believe 65% of the population in India at that time would be a working population. And it is estimated by 2026, the, uh, job, the shortage in the, world, uh, in the markets would be about 45 million people. Whereas India would have an excess of 56 million people. So it is very important that these people are properly trained, made ready for this opening. And this will happen once the infrastructure is of the same level of the uh, matured markets. And th this is important for the entire group of the countries for their own good, because India could also be the manufacturing base for a lot of the countries. And this, these are the two suggestions I have, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, I'd like to welcome the CEOs of the global business. I believe that this event within the work of the forum is really the first um, one, and Mr. Shohin told you about it. We have a lot of common problems. When I say we, I mean, of course, the global economy and the situation in the Russian economy as well. Our Indian colleague has named some global problems, really. And I'd like to use this opportunity 
and the fact that the floor was first given to a representative of the Indian business to say that India and Russia share really friendly relations. I have just had pleasure to speak with the leader of the party that has won the election, the man who will be the prime minister, and we have agreed to continue all the projects that are being implemented already, that are going, and we agreed to create new conditions for our joint work. We agreed to meet in the near future. In this connection, I believe India has not only a lot of human resources, unemployed human resources, and more than a half of the population of India are young people. How many voters you have? I think half a billion people. If When such figures are named in the countries like ours, which is not small either, the figures are still significant. And of course, the solvation of the problem is linked with the matter of the visa-free regime with openness of the borders. We have been discussing these issues with our Indian friends for a long time, and I believe that there are some limitations that are understandable and are linked with the necessity to guarantee our own labor market. But still we are moving in this direction, which would allow us to simplify the entry to our country of the human resources, and we'll continue doing this on the parity basis. Taking into account the fact that we have a lot of joint projects, for example, in the nuclear energy and in high-tech areas, of course, the exchange of the qualified workforce is becoming more and more important. It has great significance, and I believe you agree with me that it is still an area which couldn't have the massive character. People who work in nuclear energy know that in order to create a nuclear sector and to ensure the safety and security of the implemented projects, at least on the first stage, you need to have the real high-quality specialists. The Russian Federation, when it implements such projects, it does not only supply some nuclear power units and build capacities, but it creates a whole industry. And this work includes training of national staff. This is just a, the most demonstrative example, but the strategy of action of ours in other areas is the same. For example, the military technical cooperation. We are doing we are making the high tech equipment like the Brahma missile that is now been put into service in India. But now we are, we are not supplying these things. It is the joint intellectual property product and it means staff training. That is why we have already organized a certain mode of work with our Indian friends and will continue doing it. And as far as the mass employment of human resources is concerned, that could be possible in imp the implementation of large projects, including joint projects. For example, the infrastructural projects. We are waiting for a lot of infrastructural projects in Russia and that, that are the projects that will attract the uh, investments from the reserve funds. So it is good. Thank you. Allow me to give the floor to our Canadian colleague, Paul Rawlingson, the CEO of Kinders Gold Corporation. Hello. Thank you, Mr. President. I've been asked to speak to uh, the theme of invest investments. and. Uh, we're a mining company, so I'll make my comments uh, relative to the mining industry. I would say uh, we're proud. Uh, we have been uh, active in Russia for almost 20 years now. <clears throat> and uh, we are the largest uh, foreign investor <clears throat> in mining uh, thus far. We've uh, recently invested over US uh, $3 billion uh, in the mining sector. 
Our two mines are located in uh, the Far East, uh, Chukoka. <clears throat> and our experience has been uh, a very positive one, and there's been a, a lot of cooperation with the government and improvement uh, in the regulation. But we think there's more that can be done uh, to attract uh, more foreign investment uh, in mining. And the benefits of that, of course, it would uh, provide uh, additional jobs, uh, uh, train human talent, and uh, of course, uh, provide uh, additional revenue for governments. We have uh, three specific recommendations in that re regard. Uh, number one, <clears throat> please consider uh, the uh, strategic limit for minerals, um, the size or the elimination. We also think uh, there may be a possibility to simplify the claim staking process. There is a pilot project uh, currently underway, but it hasn't been rolled out in all regions. And lastly, uh, there are ways to facilitate the process to move from exploration to mining. Now, I would further suggest that um, <clears throat> we, we, would, we would think that a way to come at this would be on a pilot basis <clears throat> to pick one region or a couple of regions where there's good mineral prospectivity, such as the Far East Federal District, and, and roll out these suggestions on a pilot project. <clears throat> And uh, if, if we were to do that, we see four potential benefits. First of all, it would reinforce the government's strategic focus on economic and social development in the Far East. It would attract, we think, uh, more mining uh, investment into the Far East. Uh, the government would still retain uh, control over its subsurface resource. And lastly, uh, we think this can do be done with very little to no cost to the government. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, we would be grateful if you formulate your suggestions in a list and we will analyze them with our business community because we are working on this agenda now. We are working on the matters of simplification of different administrative procedures. We have taken a lot of decisions in that domain in customs regulation, in registration of enterprises, in the regional regulation. But of course, these, I think, are not enough. And we will go further. And I believe that your recommendations will be very useful for us. And I'm speaking without any irony here. Our business community and government are in direct, in close contact, and we are now thinking on the suggestions which could be helpful. As far as the simplification of access to um, the claim taking, simplification of the claim taking, of course, we can speak about that. We believe we have a very liberal approach to these matters. We have actually no, nothing is forbidden. If you know everything is allowed in Russia, we do not have any forbidden topics for joint bilateral work with our partners and no forbidden areas. There are rules and regulations which are linked with the so-called national resources and deposits. That does not mean that foreign investors can't go there. It means that the decision must be considered by a governmental commission. And who has worked in Russia knows that, I believe. If you think that you have faced some problems, you have the members of the government here, or government of Russia, and we would ask you to formulate exactly and to name those problems. There are terms of consideration of your claims, and the claims are taken and accepted, but still we are ready to think on how we could make the things better. As far as the simplification of exploration and mining is concerned, well, this decision is linked with the claims taking, I believe. If we allow 
If we take the claim on exploration, if we allow the exploration, then we believe that the one who invests resources into the exploration is the one who is going to take the license to actually mine the resources. Although it's not directly written now in the Russian laws. And now the interests of the state and the future investments are very much linked with this matter because after some funds have been invested into exploration, we would like to avoid the situation that a company which has explored the deposits would trade its licensing potential. The licensing process should remain within the government of the Russian Federation. You have said that yourself that the government must control this process, but maybe we need to consider some moments here, and so if you give us the, your suggestions, we'll consider them. Thank you very much, and now I give the floor to Jean-Pascal Tricot, the CEO of Schneider Electric, France. Mr. President, good afternoon. Thank you very much for meeting us this afternoon. Uh, my company, Schneider Electric, is specialized in systems, uh, in equipment and software for energy management and energy efficiency. Uh, under the guidance and with the support of your teams, we have invested a lot in Russia and we employ now 12,000 people in your country uh, developing technology and manufacturing uh, here in, uh, in the country. So my, after so much investment, my question goes naturally to your energy plans. And I would like to ask you if you could explain us where you see uh, your priorities in the field of energy, which sector, which installation, in which uh, geography. I would like to know if you can give us some color about this agreement that you signed uh, this week between Russia and China. And as it is one of the specialities of my company, if you could tell us what is a specific place of energy efficiency in your energy vision uh, for Russia. Thank you. Energy efficiency must be number one, not just in Russia, but uh, uh, everywhere around the world. This is one of the key components of success in any business, in any project. And we will, of course, uh, strive for all the areas in the energy sector to be as efficient as possible at the level of modern standards. What we would like to focus on is, uh, of course, we're already thinking about the promising sources of energy, renewable sources of energy, hydrogen sources, uh, sun energy. We're working in this area. Companies. Uh, allocate funds, they receive support from the state. At the same time, you as a specialist in energy, uh, you are well aware that in the next maybe some 30 years as a minimum, the overall consumption of energy resources will grow, but the structure of uh, the primary sources consumed will not change. And in this regard, we attach great importance to the hydrocarbon raw materials and to the development of nuclear energy. As for the nuclear energy, in the whole energy structure of our industry, it only takes 16 percent. I know that in France, the nuclear energy accounts for more than 80 percent in the whole energy sector structure. So we still have many things to do, and we have a plan of development. We are planning to reach at least 25% of share of nuclear energy in our whole energy sector structure. We do realize that it will require additional efforts on our behalf. We'll have to introduce new capacities. We are planning to launch about 20 or 25 energy blocks. It is about the number that was launched during the whole history of nuclear energy in the Soviet Union times. And of course, in this regard, we are in partner relations 
with France and we are competitors as well, but in a good sense of the world. It is, it is relevant to the equipment production, to the supplies to the world markets. I'm referring to nuclear fuel supplies. I suppose that we have a certain advantage in this area because we provide full cycle services. We are also ready to dispose of the used fuel and we do have the relevant capacities for that. And we can also suggest that foreign companies can rent those capacities. And uh, speaking about the range of orders in our nuclear energy providers, it is quite broad and we have certain plans for a whole number of years. We are planning to create a whole industry focusing on t on the on training and development of nuclear energy as a science. We participate in different international projects. We are planning to construct the most modern nuclear power plants and we are going to make them satisfy the highest security standards. So we are going to stick to Fukushima Plus standards. We are going to apply multi-layer protection in case of any disruption in the operation of a nuclear power plant. Speaking about the hydrocarbon raw materials, it is not going to get cheaper. I suppose this is evident for everyone. It is obvious that it is not going to get cheaper because the reserves the reserves are quite rich, but at the moment they are either hard to recover or allocated in the places where the infrastructure is not developed enough. It is true for our country and for other countries of the world. There are pluses and minuses in this situation, but the thing is that we can be quite confident when investing into this area. What we believe is a promising area is the offshore drilling in the Arctic seas. I suppose that the formations there are very rich. The, the reserves there are enough for the whole planet. I'm referring to the Yamal Peninsula and to the Arctic region. As you know, the first projects have already been implemented and the first uh, portion of the gas has already been delivered. In, uh, in that field. Gazprom has already done that. And of course, we are going to focus on developing of our eastern provinces. I'd like to emphasize that our companies apply the best technologies, the most environment friendly technologies that are available at the moment. I am always referring to only one example, but I use that everywhere. I visited Luke Oil Company's platform several times and I watched them working, and every gram of material was disposed of on shore. Nothing was thrown into, the, thrown into the sea, and that's how all our companies operate. I am proud to say that, and I'm also proud to emphasize that Russian companies are at least half a step advanced, half a step further than, the, than some foreign companies. As for the deal that you have just mentioned, the deal between Gazprom and our Chinese partners. It is, of course, a very big deal. I suppose that you've already heard of the parameters. Uh, the agreement is going to last for 30 years, though I suppose the reserves are enough, will be sufficient for about 50 years, because at the moment they are underestimated. We are going to work on two fields, Kavikta and Chindal, and uh, each of them contains about one trillion and a half cubic meters. So, on the whole, the, the volume of reserves is about three trillion cubic meters. So I suppose that those reserves are going to be sufficient for at least 50 years. We are going to export them to the, uh, to China and to use them within our country. This project is very important for us. It is a multifaceted one and if we do have access to a big market as a Chinese one and if they are ready to buy 
about 38 billion cubic meters of gas every year, this project is definitely going to be prof profitable and it will allow us to develop our eastern provinces and to create gas supplies, networks and infrastructure there. And then in future we will be able to proceed to the next stage. This is a so-called eastern route from western Siberia, but we've also discussed another project with our Chinese friends. And uh, that would be a western route. And then the resource base for the western route would be the western Siberia. And we suppose that the development of infra infrastructure both in the eastern and western Siberia will enable us to use the advantages of both parts of the territory there. I am referring to the eastern and western Siberia and the European part of Russia. So then we are going to have a single infrastructure that will allow us to make gas supplies to the whole territory of Russia and will also enable us to diversify our exports. So we will be able to we will be able to diversify our exports and to choose either eastern or western directions. Given that Vladimir Vladimirovich gives very broad comments, I'd like I'd like you to make your speeches shorter. I'd like to make your speeches shorter so that everyone had a chance to speak. I'm afraid that our foreign colleagues would be very unpleased. But now I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Bruckner, the head of Boston Consulting Group on financial regulation. Mr. President, uh, Russia has made enormous progress and the Russian economy has made enormous progress during the first decade of the new millennium and has become a strong member of the global economy. Now is the time to uh, move Russia and the Russian economy to the next level and there are enormous opportunities but also there are uh, strong challenges. And uh, the key levers um, for really moving the economy to the next level are <coughs> continuing openness, secondly uh, increased competition and thirdly the strengthening of institutions to ensure the rule of law. And by really providing a level playing field for many players, start-up companies, small and mid-sized companies, large corporates, will have opportunities to bring a lot more innovation, uh, <coughs> more productivity, a higher efficiency to uh, not only the economy overall, but to the different industries. A and it will mean that uh, there will be both domestic and of course foreign players to, uh, to really help ensure that there is strong growth over the next decade and more. This is of course also true for financial services. Obviously financial services plays a very important role in uh, not just mobilizing savings, uh, creating uh, strong capital markets, but also I think providing funding for the startups, for the small and mid-sized companies and for the large corporates. And in order to uh, assure that the financial sector plays a strong role, it's important to have quite a number of large players, not just two or a couple of, uh, of uh, national champions, but to have a broad sector uh, and a broad range of institutions that really can play that role. In the mobilization of funds in the capital market creation and also in the uh, funding of, of different companies of different sizes. Now, the central bank is doing a very good job in trying to clean up the banking sector, really closing down those institutions who are destroying the trust um, and destroying value. So that's one part. Uh, but I think it's important to have a broad range of institutions. Secondly, I think it's also important to ensure that the pension reform is being accelerated so that there are funds for long-term uh, projects. The second element in the financial uh, service sector is to ensure uh, the uh, application of global standards. So it's very good to see that Russia is uh, applying Basel III going forward so that we all have the same play, uh, playing field and also make sure that we do apply also to, to, the, same, to the same standards. And thirdly, uh, financial services like every other industry, like every other sector, will have um, to change fundamentally because of digitization. And there is a huge opportunity for the Russian institutions, but also institutions in general, to uh, really move financial services to a different level of quality, efficiency, productivity, by having digital payments, digital banking, 
uh, digital financial services overall. And here, Russia can really jump to the forefront in uh, Russian institutions and, and play a very strong role. So overall, um, we as at BCG, and I'm personally very confident that with increased and continuing openness, increased competition, and the strengthening of um, the institutions to ensure the rule of law, Russia will indeed, over the next 10 years, move to a completely new level of performance and really build on what it has achieved over the first 10 years during the decade. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. So, as far as I understand, it was not a question. You've just expressed a point of view and you've suggested some recommendations. And I'd like to point out that we are already working in all those areas. It is related to supporting startup, startups and strengthening the financial system in general. You've mentioned that the role of the central bank aimed on sanating the financial system is a very difficult one and we do realize that it requires lots of efforts because we do realize that it is always very painful to reduce the number of financial institutions that are not competent enough to fulfill all their obligations to their customers. That work is a very difficult one in both social and political aspects and it is also an additional load for the budget because we have to reimburse the losses for the customers when the central bank takes the relevant decisions. And we've also had to work on legislation in this area and then we've also had to work on the law enforcement and then to proceed to the work itself. But we do realize that we absolutely had to do all we've done in order to make our financial system very efficient. I suppose that we had about 1,000 banks and at the moment we have about 950. So on the one hand, the big number of banks is good, but on the other hand, in the current financial rally, it is incompatible with efficiency. That is why we are going to continue work in this dimension and of course we are open for cooperation with companies like yours as for attracting finance and uh, foreign investments i'd like to emphasize that my colleagues have already mentioned that uh, speaking about attracting investments our country was third based on the volume of attracting foreign direct investments we were third in the world. Uh, I'm going to dwell on it during our plenary sessions and I'm going to mention some figures. But of course we, had, we have to go on and, uh, we, and I'd like to emphasize that two years ago we created Russian Foreign Investment Fund and uh, recently they've raised about $10 billion. At the moment we are working with the biggest world funds and of course in this regard the what you do is in demand and of course we are going to welcome any possible joint efforts now i'd like to give the floor to our turkish colleague errol Kerspi, the chairman and the ceo of santa Pharma, on employment and social issues but i'd like to remind you Ladies and gentlemen, that the plenary is going to begin at 2.30. So other participants are probably going to criticize us if we are too late. So please try to make your speeches short. It is me who is going to be criticized, not you. Because they will not know why you were not in time. Mr. President. Mr. Pre Mr. Pre Mr. President, looking to the priorities into the area of uh, employment and labor <coughs> mobility, the votes that has been given to you came not so distant between the first and the third priority in the list, with only a little less importance on the second. This doesn't mean that the second is much, more, much less important. First priority was to introduce the macroeconomics policies that promote employment and creation of more productive jobs. The flexible labor markets that offer a diversity of work contracts are an essential part of an enabling environment. A diversity of work contracts 
allows our companies to react rapidly to market changes and quickly create jobs. Flexibility is a necessary element for competitiveness. It's clear that the government's main responsibility is to support business to create new jobs with adoption <coughs> of new, dynamic, and flexible policies. Right policies will encourage private sector to increase their employment capacities. It is important for the government to be in touch with the market in order to analyze their needs. The second priority, who took the less of the votes, Mr. President, was ensure transborder labor mobility with response to the business and labor market needs. Governments should adapt immigration policies in line with labor market needs. The labor mobility is becoming a main challenge for the business community. Labor market welcomes such immigrations according to their needs. However, in this process, the adaptation of the immigrants to the host country, language problems, and social benefit issues should be taken into account by the governments. Well-organized labor mobility will be beneficial not only for the host country, but also for the global labor market. Mr. President, to reach our goals in both priorities, we should also make employability a top priority in national education and training systems. Skills and competencies are the key determinants of an individual's place and mobility in the labor market. That is the reason why we must make employability a top priority in national education and training systems. I should also <coughs> add that strategies to increase the employability have to focus also on lifelong learning, which is a shared responsibility. We must consider increasing growth and employment by creating an economy based on knowledge and innovation. In the recent terminology, they call it smart growth. The, this requires improving the quality of education, strengthening research performances, promoting innovation and knowledge transfer throughout the world, making full use of information and communication technologies, and ensuring that innovative ideas can be turned into new products and services that create growth and quality of jobs. Now coming to the SMEs, I will not tackle the subject. I will leave my colleague, Mr. Koch, to tackle it within his subject. Thank you, Mr. President. <coughs> Mr. Koch, CEO, Metro Group, Germany, on SMEs and trade. Good afternoon, Mr. President. Um, yeah, small, medium-sized enterprises typically are the backbone of large industries, and they create a lot of value. In the Russian Federation, they are up to 90%, as I know. And our business in Metro is we are supporting independent business people. They are the small guys running product stores, restaurants, hotels. And we very much appreciate the effort that is now on the political agenda because we believe that it's not only value creation for those small independent business people, actually it's quality of life that can be increased. So actually, therefore, my question to you would be, what's your personal view on what can be done on top of it? For example, less bureaucracy, less regulation, and more support so that these people can really grow. <coughs> We're serving millions of them today. We just invited 14,000 to the Metro Expo last month and share with them the experiences. And I can tell you, I think there's huge momentum and huge potential in the Russian, Fe Russian Federation for that. And that brings me to the other subject, which is, um, and I just want to share that with you. We have been on a capital market transaction preparing that since September last year, where we shared our equity story and our conviction about the value that can be generated in Russia. Um, up to February this year, we were actually on the roadshow and telling people, and I can tell you the demand and the excitement about what can be done in Russia is completely shared by a lot of people. So we have been promoting that. But one of the concerns I need to tell you, because I think it would not be, not be right not to do so, since March and April, since Crimea and Ukraine, there has been a lot of concern, frustration, and lack of trust. So one of the concerns is really, how can trust be reestablished? Thank you very much. Well, I believe that's really the most important question 
and the motto of all the economic forum is the restoration of trust. As far as the problems which you mentioned are concerned, those problems are linked with Ukraine, with the Crimea, but they have emerged due to the lack of trust. Just look, where did the Ukrainian crisis emerge from? It emerged because President Yanukovych postponed signing the association agreement with the European Union. And what followed? The coup d'etat, supported by our American and European partners. What goes next? Chaos and now the full-scale civil war, which we are seeing. In the post-Soviet space and in the world, you have to be very careful. You have to take the fundamental basis of state's existence with very great care. If we don't do that, then chaos emerges and destabilization of the situation in politics and in economy. As far as the Crimea is concerned, we have an open view, open position. We have nothing to hide. We have really ensured the opportunity for the citizens to express their will freely, and they have chosen to come to the referendum and vote for their future. You can't make 90% of the population of the voters come to the polling stations. They are coming themselves. And 96% of them have voted for the joining with Russia. That is the fact. If we hadn't done it, we would have great tragedy there now, even greater tragedy than in the cities of Ukraine, like Odessa, where people were burnt alive in a building and about 50 more people were just lost. We do not know where they are now. We didn't let such a tragedy happen in the Crimea. And we'd like you to be unbiased in your evaluations of this situation. What do we have to do to restore trust and confidence? We have to work with each other. We have to be in a dialogue. For example, we still can't sign a comprehensive partnership agreement with the EU. There, is, there are constantly problems emerging from one side, from another side. We've been offered consultations about the possible association of Ukraine to the, uh, to the European Union, with the European Union, but still no consultations have happened. Our Minister for Economic Development, Mr. Lukaev, went there, and he's a liberal person in the good sense of it. He went there, he returned, and he said that he heard nothing but slogans, mottos. So we expect that we'll have to reach a meaningful, substantive agreement and we'll have to have meaningful dialogue, as diplomats say. We believe that it must begin. There is no other way to restoring trust and, and confidence. We have to have direct talks and find mutual compromise with respect of legal rights and interests of each other. As far as the SMEs are concerned, of course, that's a very important issue. And I have to admit that we've done a lot for the recent years, but not enough, of course. The development of the small and middle business in Russia is not going as well as we need. I wouldn't give you the figures now. Of course, we have the system of the su of support of the SMEs at the federal and regional levels, and when we allocate resources from the federal budget, we allocate we allocate the resources to the regions because the SMEs are working in the regions. What do we have to do more? What else? We have, of course, to lift and lower the barriers, economic, uh, the bureaucratic barriers. What we have done, we have simplified the registration of enterprises. We have made the 
access to power grids better for them. We have lowered the the customs burden for the enterprises which work in the foreign market. And this is linked with the fact that it is forbidden to enterprises to have business, to enterprises that have the customs in their shareholder, as their shareholder. What do we have to do to give access to the cheap loans, cheap financial resources? We have to solve it. It's a difficult task, but if we don't uh, solve it, we can't develop small business. We have quite a few other people who would like to speak and to ask questions. From Indonesia, uh, Mr. Bambang, who is the president of the Trade and Commerce Chamber of Indonesia, Yopo Coppola, uh, president of the Confederation of Finnish Industry, Jorgen Rasmussen from Carlsberg Group, who is a co-chairman on the European side of the Russian EU Businessman Roundtable, Lord Peter Mendelssohn, who is uh, president of the Global Council and who for many years was uh, the EU Trade Commissioner. Uh, quite a few other colleagues, but your protocol people are indicating that it is time to, let's say, let you go to the next um, meeting. And so I would like to thank you, Mr. President, for your detailed answers to these questions and your comments. Uh, as we understand, uh, a lot will be further clarified in uh, your remarks at the plenary. And so, uh, colleagues, uh, I would like to invite you after the plenary uh, to the press conference. And at the press conference, you will be able to convey your views to the world public. And now, let me repeat what I said in the very beginning. I expect that we can hope that this kind of forum will be held in the future as part of the St. Petersburg Economic Forum. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming. And thank you for uh, discussing with us both Russian and global problems. I think it will be useful for everyone. And in any case, this is a very positive signal for developing cooperation with uh, Russia. As for the questions uh, that we have not heard, or uh, perhaps some questions even that I uh, that, that were mentioned, such as the labor market. I will uh, talk about this at the plenary, about our plans for the future and about the steps that we intend to take to further develop the Russian economy. Thank you.